Today we're analyzing Huntington Ingalls Industries, ticker HII. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss all my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, this company is operating in the aerospace and defense industry. They have a market cap of $8.9 billion, enterprise value of $11 billion. So you see about $1 billion, actually $2 billion in net debt on this business. It's about 20% of the overall enterprise value. So Huntington engages in designing, building, overhauling, repairing military ships in the United States. So this is a key thing, military ships, something to pay attention to that's definitely part of the defense segment. Operates through three segments, Ingalls, Newport News, and Mission Technologies. They design and construct non-nuclear ships, that's a key piece as well, um, amphibious assault, especially warfare, service combatants, na national security cutters, U.S. Navy, U.S. Coast Guard. Also provides nuclear powered ships, aircraft carriers, submarines. Um, they offer naval nuclear support services like design, construction, maintenance. It also provides life cycle sustainment services. So this is very much focused on the U.S. Navy. Definitely a naval um, defense industry um, here. So beta 0 0.65, that's a key metric because the lower the beta, the lower the volatility in the stock price, which means lower the volatility of the stock price, it tends to signal a higher quality business, higher quality company. Now, for whatever reason, we only have data going back to 2010 on our return on invested capital chart. But if we start looking from 2011, we see they lost money in 2011, but they've been profitable every year since then. And you've had some really good years. So 5% in 2012, 9% 2013, and then we hit double digits, 10%, 13%, 20, 16, 28, 18, 20, 10, and 9%. So um, overall, pretty good numbers here. When we look at the 10 years, we see 15% return on invested capital, 28% return on equity. It has had some decline since 2018, so it's a little bit of a concern. But overall, these are very high quality numbers. We had one year in the last 12 in which you were unprofitable. Overall, that's still pretty good, and I would say is a reasonable number. Your return on equity here of 20 percent is impressive and certainly exceeds my metric for a high quality business. So I'm leaning towards this being a high quality business at this point. Um, at a key metric of this, this certainly has a moat. Um, when you are building and repairing and working on U.S. military ships, you have basically a designated partner in the U.S. military and that defense spending is generally favored by both parties in the United States. And so defense spending tends to rise every year. It's probably nice for um, having just that assured customer base for their products. Now, with that said, gross profit margins you here see here are 19%. These big U.S. military contractors a lot of times are forcibly capped by U.S. law on the profit margins they're allowed to have. So we shouldn't expect a lot of major pricing power. They can't price things more than certain cost plus type contracts. So you're not going to see amazing margins with a business like this. Now, PE of 17 is actually pretty reasonable for a business where you know that you have very strong moat, very strong ability to market your product. You're going to have demand in future years. The U.S. government has an incentive for you to be profitable because they want you to still be around. So it's good to see that this price is pretty reasonable. You know, an average business might trade at a 15 PE in the S&P 500. This is certainly an above average business. They're trading a PE of 17. You still have basically a five and a half percent, maybe almost a, almost a 6% earnings yield here, you're growing at 4.8, let's call it 5%. So you say 6% plus 5%, bam, you got 11% type returns. Um, your free cash flow and EPS are both growing faster than that. 11% free cash flow growth, 17% EPS growth. All of those are very impressive numbers. Now, what we can see is you're not growing stably year after year. You had a few years here with very low growth, 2015, 2016, impressive growth, 2018, 2019, and slower growth in these years. So you do have some volatility in what that growth might be, but overall, you're getting pretty good numbers. Now, the revenue didn't near double in this time frame. You went from $6.8 billion to $10.6 billion. So you're not really growing at the rates where I'd like to see that doubling on that basis. Um, your operating profit is consequently pretty flat. So although you did get up to $900 million in operating profit by 2018, you're back down to half a billion by 2022. And so we compare half a billion EV of 11. So, you're, you know, this is why you have these, you know, 20 times EV to EBIT. That's not great. It's not ideal what those numbers would be. Now, your EPS has improved even more than that. I'm really curious to see if they've been doing share buybacks. We're going to study that on the income statement because um, that EPS is growing way faster than operating profit. You just look at operating profits flat, but EPS is almost triple for the decade. <sighs> Something weird is going on there. Um, dividends per share, 478. So you, you've gone from paying 50 cents in dividends to now paying 478. That's a big dividend. 
about a 2% dividend yield. That's a good component to think about as well. You have a 2% dividend yield, plus you're getting this baseline 5% growth. You don't want to extrapolate just this sort of EPS growth indefinitely. You can't have EPS growth exceed revenue growth on a permanent basis. At some point, the math doesn't work. You'd have infinite margins. So at some point, your EPS growth has to come in line with revenue growth, and you're only in that 5% range. So when you have 2% dividend yield plus 5% growth, you're saying maybe the lower end of my return is around that 7% mark. Now, one caveat there is going to be, of course, any share buybacks they're able to execute, and we're going to go look at that next. If you're enjoying this video, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. So let's go look at the income statement. Now, of course, you know, like I said, gross profit margins are going to be capped by the government, so you can't do a lot there. Um, there's not a ton of incentive for you to have like the lowest cost production because you have that guaranteed customer base. Now their interest income has come down a little bit. That's a good sign. So that's one reason why your operating profit could be mostly flat, but you could be doing a little better. That also would have had the benefit from lower interest, lower um, taxes. You can clearly see, you know, although in 2017 they had pre-tax income of 772 million, and in 2018 their income increased to 971 million, they actually had lower income taxes. Why is that? I've covered it in previous videos. You had the in, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, tax cut in 2017. It cut the corporate tax rate so that even though the pre-tax income went up, the income tax actually went down. So you had this really massive impact on the net income line, and so that's a big reason as well why you could see this net income going up so fast um, so much faster than your operating profit but also you have four years in a row here of other non-operating income that's quite significant relative to their overall offer operating profit so i'd be curious what's going on here this would be something we're studying when you think about like 300 million dollars in non-operating income compared to 517 million dollars of operating income that's a big chunk of your overall bottom line profits. So you need to understand what's going on there. Now, they did have buybacks as I thought they would because you went from 50 million shares outstanding to 40 million shares outstanding. So they retired about 20% of their shares outstanding. That's like a 2% boost to your overall um, record here. So if we say, okay, we got revenue growth of 5%, we have a dividend yield of 2%, you have buybacks uh, you know, optimistically of 2%, 5 plus 2 plus 2 is 9. So you can see a good method where you're going to hit like a 9% type return in this business, even if you're not getting operating leverage. If you do get operating leverage over your over the time you hold it, if you get that free cash flow or EPS growing faster than revenue, then you're going to get the ability to earn those double digit returns in what is a pretty high quality business. So we're seeing some really strong signs here of what could be attractive for this company. Now, we're building ships. So how expensive is it in terms of PPE? 3.4 billion in PPE. They don't have a lot of inventory. And you compare 3.4 billion to half a billion here. So one out of six or one out of seven. And we compare that to return on capital, 16, 17%. Yeah, you're getting those good returns. You know, in terms of the overall like assets that were needed here. I mean, I'm kind of excluding the goodwill, which, you know, they, for acquisitions they've made in the past, excluding these intangibles. They're not carrying a lot of inventory. I'm excluding the cash and accounts receivable. And on those tangible assets, you're getting pretty good returns. So I'm happy with how they're managing that as well. But on top of that, they're offsetting these PPE of three and a half billion by two and a half billion of long-term debt. So it's showing that basically you only have like a billion dollars of net PPE, you know, against those, you know, those assets. You're getting cheap debt relative to the cost of equity in order to fund the balance sheet. That's a good way of managing the overall balance sheet. So that looks good. It's not an unreasonable amount of debt um, for the size of this business. See cash flow from operations. So one of the things I'm going to look here is depreciation amortization and compare that to my PPE investment. It's going to give me a little bit of an idea of what I should expect going forward. See at the beginning of the decade that they were had a higher depreciation than PPE. And so that's why, you know, initially the depreciation drops in future years down to 186 million. But then in 2016, they start spending more on PPE than they had in depreciation, which is why it starts ramping back up again so that now they're paying a little bit more in, de in depreciation and amortization. Now, we've now passed it so that your depreciation is above our most recent year's PPE investment. So if you do that over time, it's going to go back down, gives you a little bit of predictability for the future. Um, they have some stock-based compensation. I don't really know why you have stock-based compensation in a defense company. Um, I don't know why I have it anywhere, but certainly not necessary. Um, but they are buying back shares every single year. But it looks like in the last three years, they really cut back on those buybacks, probably just enough to offset the stock-based comp. 
um, not really decline the share count. And I think that's what we saw. Yeah. Your share count declines have stagnated since 2019. So you really want to study, you know, what is that, um, capital allocation philosophy, especially around shares and dilution. When you study this company, they have been paying dividends. It used to be a very small amount of the company, but now it's, it's growing to be a lot more significant than the issuance of common stock, um, buyback. So overall, I think this company looks really good. Um, Defense companies are attractive and they turn into a lot of times being high quality businesses. Um, politics aside, the US government spends a lot of money on defense. That money goes up almost every year and there's not a lot of competition between the defense companies. Once you have been you know, certified to build a certain ship or to produce a certain item for the Navy, you're probably going to have that business for years and years, decades and decades. You can be assured that you're going to be able to produce those products at a profit and you have a steady market. And then even when the U S stops buying it, a lot of times the U S will allow you to sell it to the U S as allies and NATO. And so there's a steady market for a lot of these things for many years in the future, especially when you have like stuff like repairs, those repairs are able to be spent on ships that maybe are no longer being produced new, but you might be the person that does the repairs. And so there's that constant market for your products. This makes it a high quality business. You get dependable cash flows. So everything here looks really, really good. I think a lot of comp people would be interested in studying this company and learning if it's a good fit for your portfolio. For my portfolio, it's not a good fit and it's not going on my watch list for two reasons. One, the largest position in my current portfolio today is already a defense company, so I'm not interested in buying more defense companies. And two, the growth rate's just a little lower than I'd like. So they're at revenue growth of 5%. They're probably one of the largest you know, shipbuilders and repairers in the country already. There's probably not a lot of market share that they can steal to grow much faster. And so I see, you know, I see a clear path like 9% returns and there is some possibility for those double digit returns, but I don't see an obvious way where I'm going to be getting those 12, 15, 18% type returns that I'd really like to see. And for that reason, I'm going to pass on it, but I think it could be a really good business for many people to consider, especially if you like dividends, the fact that they're growing those dividends and you know, it's a stable, secure business. So hope you enjoyed something for this. Learn something, hit that like button, subscribe. You can check out the other watch list stocks I have up above, and I hope you'll check those out. A great way to support the channel is to check out quickfs.net. That is the software I'm using to make this video. This is the software I use to study companies. The affiliate link is the first link in the description below. Use my link to get a free or paid account to support the channel. I get a commission if you choose to make an account with them. So please consider supporting the channel through that way. Thank you for listening and until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.